nations of the earth that multiplied in the days of, in, uh, before and after Noah uh, all turned to idolatry. And God cut himself off from all those nations and raised up Abraham and said, I'm going to make out of thee a great nation. That's where the nation Israel came from. They didn't exist. God created them out of Abraham and they multiplied in Egypt and then God raised up Moses to go deliver Israel out of, out of Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, to the land that God promised them when he promised Abraham not only a nation but a land to dwell in for an everlasting possession. But the reason that God created that nation is that he told Abraham is that through that nation shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Since all the nations turned from God, God raised up the nation of Israel and they were to become his testimony nation. And it's through them that God will win back all the other nations of the earth and, and restore his authority back on this earth that, don't forget, Satan usurped in deceiving Adam and Eve and in deceiving the nations to worship idolatry. Whenever you worship idols, you're worshiping the devil and because uh, all idolatry is of Satan. And so the world has turned to, toward Satan and God is going to uh, restore the earth to his authority through that nation of Israel and through the nation of Israel all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But along the way God gave Israel after they left Egypt, they're in, Mount, they're in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, God gave Israel the law and one of the things that we're studying, well we're looking at three reasons God gave the law. The first is right here, let me just read the verses and then we can kind of review and move ahead. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3 it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, I have seen what you, what, uh, you, you have seen what I, have, what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which I shall speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord had spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the, the people unto the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, help us to understand the purpose in this law and be able to study our Bible from an understanding of what you're accomplishing in the nation of Israel and how someday you will regain your authority on this earth through them. Father, help us to learn to the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth as we go so that we might understand what salvation is today and, uh, and how you saved us through the gift of your Son through his death, burial, and resurrection. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now what I was about to say is there's three reasons that God gave the law as you look at these verses. First of all, it, it, it was to prepare Israel, to call them for the purpose of their calling, to, to prepare them for what God's purpose for them will be, and that is they will ultimately be a peculiar treasure to God. They will be above all the other nations of the earth. They will be above the other nations in the earth because it's God's purpose through Israel to regain the earth unto his authority. That the nation of Israel will be a whole kingdom of priests. They will be the, the go-between between a between holy God and the sinful nations that have turned to idolatry. The, they'll, they'll be a kingdom of priests and they'll be a holy nation. If they're going to serve God, Israel, unlike all the other nations, is going to be a holy nation. So this, it prepares them for their calling. At, at the same time, we see that in, in the giving of the law here, that as you look back at verse 5, it says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be. The law is also a temporary covenant, contract, between God and the nation of Israel, whereby Israel will be blessed or cursed, depending on their obedience to the law. He's going to give them the law. Their job is to become, be a holy nation. They said, all that the Lord said we will do, and so the Lord's going to say, okay, here's what holiness is. Uh, before it's all done, however, they'll find out they can't do it. But nonetheless, God is going to fulfill his promise to Abraham. The nations of the world will be blessed through the nation of Israel. It just won't be through their keeping of the law. 
God will eventually, as we've already seen, have to give Israel a new covenant where rather than writing the law on stone and saying, keep this, he's going to write in their heart. He's going to eventually give the believing remnant of Israel the Holy Spirit. And they're going to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, and then God will bless them permanently, and then they'll be the people that God called them to be. The third purpose in the law is that the, the nation of Israel, the purpose of the law is to keep them from being cut off from God, to actually protect them from being cut off from God like the nations of the earth were cut off. Now that, that reminds me, uh, two people have reminded me to always say to you that when, God sa when the Bible says that God has cut off the nations, the Gentiles are cut off from God, there is a possibility for Gentiles to be saved in the Old Testament. You don't read about it because it's not the time of Gentile salvation through Israel. But as you study the Old Testament, a, a Gentile could go and become one with the nation of Israel and God would treat them as his people. The other way is the Gentiles, he told Abraham, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you and in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So a Gentile nation who realized that Israel was God's people and recognized and believed in the God of Israel there was favor going to be given toward them. So there is some Gentiles who were saved, but it's hard to find them in the Bible. <laughs> because as you're back here, God's dealing with Israel, preparing them for their calling, and eventually when they become that nation, a kingdom of priests, then they'll go and teach the nations to observe all things that they have been commanded. So uh, while there is Gentile salvation, what you have here is God dealing with the nation of Israel. And you know, there's really like a fourth reason in the law, but it's really found in all three of those reasons. And that is, the law was never given to save anybody. That the law, every one of these things that, that God, his calling of the nation of Israel to be these kind, this kind of people, the, 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 to... to uh, uh, to be to receive the blessing, to live under the blessings of God, and to uh, uh, be kept from being cut off from God, all those things that the law was given for is going to be fulfilled in a new covenant that God's going to give to the nation of Israel. There, there's a, like an overall view of the law, and that is is to teach Israel they can't do it, and they going to need they need God. And that's always, even Adam and Eve were supposed to learn that in the garden, that their fig leaves wasn't good enough before God, that God is going to provide salvation. He is going to provide the covering. And the nation of Israel, under the law, that all these things that the law will bring the nation of Israel to, they're not going to do it through keeping of the law because they're not holy. They're, they're going to need a savior, and he's going to provide the means by which all of this will become true. Now, what we did is, in looking at the law, we, we want to eventually get to where actually we look at some of the details of the law because it's important for us to know about this because the law is going to run all the way from Exodus 19.20 here all the way through the life ministry of Jesus Christ. Christ is going to shed his blood in order to make the means by which he could deal with Israel under a new covenant. So all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the Old Testament, all the way to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 1,500 years, they're going to be operating under the law. So it's going to be important to understand what this law is all about. So we've been dwelling on that. Uh, and, the other, uh, and as we've done that, what, last week what we did is we looked and realized how when you get to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, how much timetable, how much time has gone by. Now hold your place here. We'll be right back. But come to Numbers chapter 10. This is how far we got last week. I want to show you a short timetable and then a long timetable. Now when you're studying the book of Exodus, you'll find out Moses goes up to the mount. He spends 40 days. He comes down because they broke the law. And then eventually he deals with that situation. God calls him back up. He spends another 40 days on the mount. Comes back down. Then they build the tabernacle that God instructed him to build. Then you come to the book of Leviticus and then God calls to Moses out of that tabernacle and keeps on giving more of the law. And then you come to the book of Numbers and they start doing a, a census of the nation of Israel, making sure the people are redeemed and separated out into tribes and nations and how they're going to follow, how they're going to, when they, when they take journeys, what, what groups go in first. They're, it's organizing them uh, and that's what the book of Numbers is about. And you come to Numbers chapter 10 and verse uh, 11. It says, and it came to pass on the twentieth day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle of the testimony and the children of Israel took their journey 
out of the wilderness of Sinai and a cloud rested on, uh, in, in the wilderness of Paran. Now, so if you notice that they're in the second year of the second, uh, of the second month of the second year. If, if you're holding your place in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, it says, in the third month, uh, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. So Exodus 19 is the first year in the third month. It's, I said last week, I kept saying 10, but I, my math wasn't going in my head real well. <laughs> 11 months later, you're now at Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. For 11 months, God has been giving Israel the law. Well, you better think twice when you say, oh, especially Israel, all that the Lord said we will do. 11 months the Lord giving the law to the nation of Israel, what they're going to live under, how they're going to live and conduct themselves. It's not just 10 commandments and it's all over. They, the Lord got through 10 commandments and Israel said to Moses, wait, this is scaring us to death. The mountain's shaking, there's lightning, there's earthquakes. You go up to the mountain, you get the information from the Lord, you bring it back to us, but we're afraid to stand here any longer. And so there's 80 days that Moses spends with the Lord after that. And, and, uh, and then when he builds a tabernacle, the Lord continues to give more instructions. It takes you from Exodus 19 to Numbers chapter 10 just to get the law. Now, in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, we won't go there, but that's when the Israel, actually, they leave Mount Sinai here in chapter 10 of Numbers. And they, in, in, within a very short time, within just another few months, they make their way to Kadesh Barnea. That's the city just on the other side of the Jordan River where they're going to go into the Promised Land. In fact, if you read it in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 1, the first few verses there, it says there's only 11 days journey for them to make it to the Promised Land. But they wandered and died in the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered 38 more years after Numbers chapter 10. And the reason they wandered in the wilderness is when they came to Kadesh Barnea and they sent the spies in, and the spies talked about giants in the land and all. The people were afraid and refused to go in and said, Oh, you brought us here to kill us. And, God, and, and what about our wives and our children? And so God says, Okay, you're going to die in the wilderness by your own word. And your children are going to go in the promised land. And when you come to the book of Deuteronomy, that D-E-U-T, that beginning of that word, that, that's, you know, do the, the second, it's second, the second giving of the law. Because when you come to Deuteronomy, it's after that 38 years now, and the, 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 you got two years till they come to Kadesh Barnea, 38 years after that, 40 years have passed. The first generation is dead. Moses goes back over the law and prepares that generation. He dies at the end of Deuteronomy, and Joshua leads him into the land. So you get an idea of how much time is passing, how much most, most of that time is spent in the giving of the law. That, that will just tell you how extensive the law is. And it's going to be the means by which God is going to deal with the nation of Israel for 1,500 years. Uh, you still got Numbers 10? I showed these verses last time, but as they journeed, in verse 35 it's, uh, of Numbers 10, it says, And it came to pass, when they set, forth, uh, set forward, Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, now see, that when the ark moved, that's when they traveled. So as they're traveling, Moses is actually praying, Lord, make sure the enemies run from us, that they don't bother us. And then verse 36, and when it rested, now they're going to have camp again. He said, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. As if as they, when they travel, the Lord goes before them to protect them. And when they stop, he comes back and rests right there with them. Now that tells you where God is in the world. He's not in Egypt. He's not among the Gentiles. God is with the nation of Israel. They are his people. And, and so, so you understand the law is not given to save them. They're, they have this special position with God because of a covenant God made with Abraham. That those people would be his people and he would be their God. And now as they're traveling, Moses is calling God to be there and be with them. In fact, look at number six again. We didn't really get to do this last time. There's a blessing that the, that the, uh, the priests are to bestow upon the nation of Israel. And it's found in verses 24 through 27. It says, here's what the priests will say to the nation of Israel. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance 
that is his character, his favor and his, his uh, support and approval. That the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name among the children of Israel and I will bless them. So God is with the nation of Israel. Don't you wish you had God's grace? Don't you wish you had God's peace? Well, we'll just tell you a little bit because it's just too good to hold back. There comes a time in which God stops his dealings with the nation of Israel in a time in which some wrath and war should have began because of their rejection of his son. And God saved a man named Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles with a message to us Gentiles and every one of Paul's epistles. You know how it starts out? Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Today in the age of grace, God has turned to us. All the nations who had turned from him and God through Israel was going to bring blessing to, the, to those nations, but Israel failed to be and is not yet the people God has called them to be. They will be in the future. But in the meantime, we live in what's called the dispensation of the grace of God, where God interrupted his dealings with Israel because of the cross of Christ made it possible for God to deal with all mankind individually, not nationally, individually on the basis of grace through the blood of Christ. And is offering you reconciliation through Jesus Christ today. Salvation is God's gift bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ for all mankind. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he totally, completely paid for every one of your sins so that God the Father can offer you grace your, his undeserved, unmerited favor. Let his face shine upon you. You don't have to pray that. I don't have to close this meeting and say uh, in, in those words, uh, and Lord, make his face shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. He is gracious to you. And if you're saved, you're saved by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And what we, when you read Romans chapter 5, you have a standing in his grace. You're already there. I don't have to bestow that or bless you with that. God is extending his grace to you. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a standing all your life long in his favor and in his grace. He's there with you. You don't have to call him and ask him. He doesn't leave you. He'll never forsake you. So what, what Israel had here as far as God with them, today by God's grace, you have the opportunity, as it says in the book of Colossians, the riches of his glory is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Lord taking up his residence in us. And today he does that by the very person of his Holy Spirit coming into those who believe the gospel of grace. Now, that's way ahead of where we're at. Uh, but I want you to see back here, Israel had a very special place. And we have a very special place today. Uh, we're not the nation of Israel. God turned to us in his grace. But, but back here when he's dealing with the nation of Israel, this, we're looking at this aspect about this, the, the covenant of law being a temporary contract between God of, and Israel whereby they're going to be blessed or cursed. Well, back there in Exodus chapter 19 verse 5, it says, Now therefore, if you will obey his, my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then... So God puts a conditional. He didn't put a condition to the promise to Abraham, but he did put a condition on the nation of Israel to reach these blessings and a condition that they say, all that you say we will do. But Moses don't even finish getting the law when he's got to go down because they're already breaking the commandments. And, uh, and so God will have a new means by which Israel will finally be blessed. But the, the law does tell us what holiness is. And it is a temporary contract. You know, a contract is... You know, we're going to sign a contract here, and you notice all the wording. Moses tells the people, the people say, all, that we, all the Lord says we will do. Moses takes those words, goes back to the people. He's negotiating a contract. And the contract will eventually be signed and sealed in blood, that God will do some things for them if they do some things. And if they don't do some things, God's going to do some other things to them. And so it's a temporary contract by which they're going to either be blessed or cursed depending on their obedience to the law. And, uh, and we, want to, we want to look at that aspect because as we're going to go through the rest of the Old Testament, this is how God's dealing with Israel. And I, say, I take, tell it to you now so that you realize if we live under the dispensation of grace, and today by God's grace you have a standing in grace. Everybody thinks on the basis of the law. If I do good, God's going to bless me, and I did bad, and I got a flat tire today, I lost my job, and I'm homeless. And We always relate 
different things in our life as if we're doing good things for God, good things are going good, well in our life. And if we do bad things and God is cursing us, that's not, a, that's not the administration we live under. The, the, Israel did, and you're going to see that. But you need, when you see that, to realize that you have a whole different standing with God. You have a standing in grace. And God deals to, today with you based on what Christ did, and he sees you perfect in Christ, complete in Christ. Now, sin does have consequence in your life, so don't doubt that a moment. But, but it's not God bringing any kind of judgment upon you. God deals with us in his favor. So let, let's look at this conditional contract. To do that, let's start out just back looking at the law. Exodus chapter 19, verse 20. Sometimes people can quote the Ten Commandments, sometimes they can't. But it says in Exodus 20, verse 1, that's where I wanted, I don't know what I just said. Exodus 20, verse 1, it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the number one commandment. Now when it says no other gods before me, that means that God has preeminence. It doesn't mean you have some after. It, it means that God is preeminent, that nothing takes the place of God in your life. Now God is creator and judge. God is the supreme being. So when he says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, God is supreme over everything in life. See, the nation of Israel will eventually succumb to what the Gentiles came to, and that is bowing down to idols. But when you come to the New Testament, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't bow down to idols anymore, but they're still guilty of breaking the very first law. Because where they learned not to bow down to idols, because God taught them a lesson in the Old Testament, they began to bow down to man. They began to bow down to religion. They began down, to bow down to, to their own authority or their own righteousness. And they rejected Jesus Christ when he came into the world. That's important for you to know because they ended up taking what man said above what God said. So they got the wrong God, don't they? They ended up taking religious leaders and putting them in a place where God doesn't place them. And they put those leaders in the place of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So whether you talk about it being idols or whether you talk about your religious performance or religious men or your religious denomination, that's still something that replaces God. And that's what the Pharisees and all did. That's where we live today. Hardly any of you, I think, go home and have a statue in, in your house and bow down to that statue. And, and most of the people around us, now there's some that do, but most of the people around us don't. But when you talk about what's true in their life, what they're trusting in to save them, it's not what God said. It's what they think. It's what their religion taught them. It's what their grandma believed. And, and they end up taking other things and replacing God with those other things, especially their own thinking, their own thoughts, rather than saying, he's God, what did he say? And he says salvation is in his son. So the first law, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second, verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now that's covering quite a bit of territory, isn't it? <laughs> don't, don't make any image, whether it be God up in heaven or the angels up in heaven. Don't make any image of those things. Don't make any image of any human being walking around the earth or animal walking around the earth or anything creeping around the earth. Don't make any images of that. Even the things that you might imagine that are under the earth. Don't make any images of those things and bow down yourself to them. Verse 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You realize if you bow down, God's got to be first. He's before all things. Then the second is, don't create something and bow down to it. Because now you've, you've broken the first law, but now you're, you're substituting God for something that you've made with your own hands. And, and God says, I'm a jealous God, and I'll visit iniquity unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Hate means that you put God underneath that. You didn't put God first, you put him less. And that's hating God. And it says in verse 6, showing mercy unto them that love me and keep my commandments. Now remember, there's an if 
There's, you're going to learn about conditions in the nation of Israel. There's going to be blessings and cursings. Well, here's the first sign of blessing and cursing, isn't it? For those who make images of anything and bow down to them, God says, I'm a jealous God. When he says, I'm a jealous God, that a jealousy means to be intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness. Now, we understand unfaithfulness and jealousy when you talk about husband and wife relationship. But God dealing with the nation of Israel, he's telling them, I'm intolerant over rivalry, as if I have to compete with someone else. And, and your unfaithfulness to me. It, it's, it's, it, when I say uh, intolerant, it means to provoke to anger and or judgment. So it's not a... When, when you see God is jealous, that's why he says visiting the iniquity unto the father's children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You know where an example of that is? What's happened to the Gentiles? Gentiles have been cut off from God already for some time now. For 500 years. Because they turned to idolatry back in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. And God has cut off the Gentiles in that idolatry. He's warning the nation of Israel that he'll do it to them if they, if they bow down to those images. But if they don't bow down to those images, he's also a merciful God. Because they're going to need his mercy, let me tell you. Just like you and I need his mercy. Showing mercy unto them that love me and keep my commandments. The, the next commandment is verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now there's blessings and cursings in this law, isn't there? And, and now there's a warning, not only... Don't put anything before the Lord. Don't make any graven image and bow down. Make sure you don't use his name in vain. It's amazing how our society uses Jesus Christ in vain so often and God telling him who to damn and who not to and think absolutely nothing of it. The Lord Jesus Christ says every idle word a man will give an account of in the day of judgment. An idle word, you know, idle is a person who's idle, he's lazy. That, uh, a person who doesn't think. My dad always taught, says that swearing is a crutch uh, for, for uh, the, uh, for cri people crippled in vocabulary like myself. <laughs> but anyhow, it is a crutch. Lazy. They, rather than think of something and saying it properly, they say it in a slang and they use the Lord's name to do it. Idleness. There's a warning here. You don't have to, not, a, not even a graven image, but here don't even use the Lord's name in vain because he's not going to hold them guiltless who does. The, the fourth commandment, verse 8. Reset, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy sons, nor thy daughters, nor thy manservants, nor thy maidservants, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So Israel as God's people are to keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, there's a church just down here on 13 Mile will tell you you've just taken the mark of the beast because you're sitting here on Sunday and yesterday was the Sabbath day and you weren't in church on yesterday, on Saturday, and you're breaking this law and you're condemned. Well, it certainly does sound like the seventh day. I mean, this is Sunday is the first day of the week, right? Saturday is the last day of the week. So it sounds like we're pretty uh, uh, guilty of breaking this law, except if you were here last week. We looked ahead to the dispensation of grace where it says sin will not have dominion over you for you're not under the law but under grace. You're not these people. This is the nation of Israel. Watch this. Come over to Exodus 31. And it, it, I, I teach it now because you need to know that the, na the law is a contract between God and the nation of Israel. It's not a contract between you and God. You're not under a contract. You're under grace. A, disp a dispensation of grace where God is offering you freely eternal life as a free gift from Him. But in, in Exodus chapter 31, this is how this part of the law ends. Ex Exodus 31 verse 12 says, 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, who? The children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep my Sabbath, therefore, for it, uh, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death, and whosoever doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whosoever doth any work in the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe it, the Sabbath, uh, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord hath made heaven and earth, and, 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 uh, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed, and he gave unto Moses, and when he had given uh, Moses, no, and he gave unto Moses, and when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, uh, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So you see it's coming to a conclusion there, at least the moral part of the law. When you read through that, it says that the Sabbath day is a sign of the covenant, of the contract between God and Israel. Out of all the different parts of the law, the Sabbath day is particularly set apart as the sign of this covenant between God and Israel. So it's Israel that keeps the Sabbath. And did you notice that in each case, whether it be in Exodus 31 or Exodus 20 there, that as soon as he mentions the Sabbath day, he goes back to creation? What is God's purpose for the nation of Israel? Through them, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. The sign that God is going to use the nation of Israel to restore his authority in the earth is the Sabbath day. Because he created the earth in six days and rested the seventh day. And the sign that they're going to be the people by which this is going to be achieved, that the authority of Christ is going to be established, is the sign of that covenant. Therefore, they're Israel's to keep it constantly. Well, if you understand that we live in the dispensation of grace and that we're not the nation of Israel and God has called us for a different calling, one of the things that you learn about the age of grace is that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. The reason the Sabbath day doesn't have anything to do with us, number one, we're not Israel. Number two, we're not under a contract between God as God was with Israel. And number three, our calling is heaven, not this earth and what God accomplished in this earth and what the purpose of the earth is for. So anyhow, you just need to realize that that part of that law, that, that the law is associated, uh, the, the Sabbath is associated with the law as a sign uh, of the covenant between God and Israel. Go back to Exodus 20. It says, number five, law number five, honor thy father and thy mother that they di thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, if you don't know, in the, in the New Testament, a man comes to trick Christ and he wants to know what, what's the summation of the law. And the Lord says, all the law is summed up in these words, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You realize if the nation of Israel loved God that way, there'd be no one before him. They wouldn't bow down any graven image. They'd never use his name in vain. They would keep the Sabbath holy unto the Lord. And also they would obey their parents, the authority that he set up over them. That, that that would be putting the Lord first in their life. To love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Then the Lord said to that man, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When you get through the next five laws, notice the first five all associated with God. The last five are associated with mankind. Our dealings with one another. And, and, and that man said, that the Lord, he said to the Lord, you're right. <laughs> in, in that, it sums up all the law and the prophets. The man recognized, wow, how brilliant. You took all that law and summed it up in those two words. Well, that, that's what it all centered around. And, and that, this number five here, honoring thy father and mother, is a way that a child honors God in their life. Interestingly, Ephesians chapter 6 repeats this for children in the age of grace, and hope you're listening, children. And he repeats this and he says, which is the first commandment with promise. 
implying that even in the age of grace, obedience to your parents may result in you live long upon the earth. Now there's not, it doesn't say you will live long upon the earth, it says that you may live long upon the earth. A child who's disobedient to their parent is going to have a hard time living a long life. Rebellion causes ruination. The Bible says, be not mocked, uh, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whosoever shall of the flesh, whosoever shall soweth to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. Living contrary to proper instructions of parents can bring misery to your life and a shorter life. So honor thy father and mother. There's a commandment with promise. Verse 13 of Exodus 20. Now it shifts toward each other. Thou shalt not kill. Now you get all these weirdos who say, oh, that means you shouldn't go to war and you better not kill any animals and all of that. Well, you know, it's the same Lord who's later going to tell them to go and kill all the uh, Canaanites that are in the land. So how can he say here, thou shalt not kill, and then later tell them to kill? Because there's a difference between war, protection, and, and, and taking what belongs to you, and another, another thing for you to go out and premeditate and take judgment upon yourself and commit murder. Thou shalt not kill is certainly a reference to premeditated murder. And there's warnings in the law that will further verify that. So thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's certainly a sin against another person, isn't it? Taking a man's wife or, or husband. It says, and thou shalt not steal. Well, thou, now you're taking another person's property. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now you're taking his, his good name away from him and, and causing uh, other kinds of problems by lying against him. Lies. In verse 17, the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not, uh, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his, uh, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. And, uh, and then that's where the people see the lightning and thundering and say, okay, Moses, <laughs> we, we, we got enough here. And, uh, and Moses goes gets more information for them. But in those ten commandments, those commandments, if thou shalt do, then here's what I will do. Well, we're not going to be able to get through this, but I want to point out to you, remember the point of looking through this section, that this is not the end of the law? Come over to Leviticus chapter 26. I'm going to skip through this and perhaps say more about it next week. But Leviticus 26 in verse 3. It says, now this is all part of the law, they're still getting more information, but we're going to be back to that if, and then you'll learn about the if not. <laughs> it says, if ye walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees, the, uh, uh, the trees of the fruit shall, uh, shall yield their fruit, uh, of, the, of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing, your threshing shall reach unto the vineyard, and the vineyard shall reach unto the sowing time. Do you understand what that is? By the time you're done picking the fruit, it's time to sow new crops. And when you sow those crops, you have to stop sowing the weed harvest to go pick the fruit because you just got so much you can't harvest it all. So the idea, as you start looking it through, here's the blessings. And, and we don't have time to read them all. Maybe we can next week. But look over in verse uh, 14. But if ye will not hearken unto me, but will not do, uh, and will not do these commandments, and if ye uh, despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye will ye break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint unto uh, over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague burning sore fever that, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and you shall sow your seed in vain and your enemies shall eat it and I will set my face against you and you shall be slain before your enemies and they that hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when none pursueth you 
So you keep my laws, I'm going to bless you. And you look at all those blessings, how the Lord's enemies will run and everything. But he says, you break my law. And here's what I'm going to do to you. And if you just look at this, if you start looking down, I don't know if your Bible shows the different breakdowns, but you got the first set of judgment in verse 16 and 17. Notice verse 18 says, and, and if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 23, and if you will not reform by these things, but will walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you and punish you yet, yet seven times more. Uh, seven times for your sins. Verse 27, if you will not walk, if you will not for all this, hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I will chasten you seven times for your sins. The nation of Israel is under contract. There's opportunity to be blessed like no other nation, right? But there's also this, if you fail, God's going to judge you, and if you don't wake up to that, He's going to judge you seven times worse, and you don't wake up to that seven times worse, seven times worse, till five courses of judgments fall upon them. Or God is going to judge them if they don't keep those laws. Now that tells you, that, you know, for Israel to say, all that the Lord said we will do. Well, you know what the testimony, I said what we're, what, uh, my purpose in going here is not just to see an overview of the giving of the law, the whole overview of the dealing with the nation of Israel. They never did keep God's laws. And God, you can actually take these five courses of judgment and watch Israel's history unfold. You know this last course of judgment when walk, God walks in fury toward them? You know where that's going to happen? It began in the Old Testament, but when it breaks loose, it breaks loose in what we call the future tribulation. When John sees Jesus Christ open up the seal judgments and he begins to pour out his wrath and his judgment upon this earth, because Peter writes in 1 Peter and says, don't think it's strange about the fiery trial that's about to try you. The Lord's going to do something here, and he says, for judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin with you, where will the unrighteous end up? So this course of judgment is how God's going to deal with the nation of Israel until he brings them to a place of repentance. He's going to chasten them till they repent and then we'll look at that, how, how God's going to restore them after they repent. But I want to end with this. Come back to the book of Romans. I've quoted it to you, but I want you to see something here. Go to Romans chapter 5. And if, if you could, it would be beneficial for you, because I'm going to quote them, so you might as well look at it too, get, get Matthew chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 5 will bring it to a conclusion. Matthew chapter 5, look at there first. Look at verse 17. This is after what's called the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord is, well, it's not after, it's, it's during the Sermon on the Mount. But it says in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Think, think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. See, Israel is never going to be able to keep the laws that God gives them. So they're never going to get blessed unless God gives them something else. And he does have something else for them. Jesus Christ coming, he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Look over in chapter 7. No, no, go back to chapter 3 of Matthew. John the, ba John the Bapti Baptist is baptizing the nation of Israel in the Jordan River. And the Lord shows up. Well, if it's for remission of sins, what sins does the Lord have to be remitted? So it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbid him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest unto me. Makes good sense to me. Verse 15, Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so for now. So now. For thus it becometh us... Notice this next two words, to fulfill all righteousness. 
then he suffered him. Jesus Christ, the law requires water cleansings to meet God and so forth. Jesus Christ says, John, just suffer, just allow this to go on. Because it, it's required of us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ came to live the perfect life that no man could ever live. And he fulfilled every detail of the law and John had to help him do that by water baptizing him. So Jesus Christ is the sinless son of God who's never sinned. And he fulfilled the law, right? Now look at Romans chapter 5. Here's the message for you and me concerning salvation today. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one. That is, Adam sinned, and his sin has passed over all mankind. We're all sinners. It's natural for us to sin. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they that receive the abundance of grace, undeserved, unmerited favor of God, and the gift of righteousness, which uh, righteousness... Uh, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore, wherefore, therefore as by, by the offense of one, judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Do you see what you need to understand today? The law was given... There's a contract. God's going to deal with Israel. Their history is going to be based on that law. But your salvation is not based on anything on that law. If anything Israel should have learned and that you should learn is that no man can keep the law. But Jesus Christ came and he fulfilled the law. And now these verses tell you that God's grace is, is that righteousness is a gift to you through one man, Jesus Christ. He goes to the cross, and by his death, he paid for all the sins of all of mankind. So that when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God will take the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He took your sins, and when you trust him as your Savior, God takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and applies it to your account and declares you righteous on the basis of faith. You know what you don't want to do? You don't want to be like Israel and say, Lord, whatever you say, I'll do it, and then you judge me. But that's what a person does when they say, I'll do, even if it's the religious ceremonies of Israel, the water baptism of John for the remission of sins. If Jesus Christ got water baptized by John to fulfill the law, then it's fulfilled, right? Amen. And his righteousness, not your acts of righteousness, his righteousness is given to you as a gift from God when you just rest in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Israel failed under the law. You're not even given that contract. But you are given the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that that, that was understandable. There might be more to learn about the law, but I pray that a person would learn that that law was never designed even to save Israel. And certainly was not given to us and couldn't save us because they couldn't keep it, we couldn't keep it. But we thank you for your son who did keep it and fulfilled it so that his righteousness might be given to us who trust in his death, burial, and resurrection as the full, complete payment of our sins. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for your grace that we do not deserve. Thank you for loving us when sometimes we don't love you back. Thank you for securing us by your grace. And I pray, Father, that each person here has already trusted the payment that Christ made, and if not, will realize there's a decision they need to make in their life that you're waiting for them to make, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall be saved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.